Welcome to Oz by Drone. Hey everybody, how are you? John here. G'day guys, I'm Greg and he's John. This is a great day we've got coming up in Australia. We're currently in the middle of fire season in Australia and um, I read this morning that it was 5 million acres. I, I'm putting it in acres because we got a few US uh, people watching our show. 5 million acres have been burnt out by fire. That's just insane. That is an incredible amount of fire. One thing that's really impacted uh, many people on the East Coast is the amount of smoke, bushfire smoke, and uh, causing a fair bit of havoc with uh, aviation movements, asthma, everything. And, uh, of course, you know, the Australian bush burns. That's how we. That's how the trees seed. I'm sure it happens other places as well. But uh, where we're very familiar with here, that when you get we get fires, that's so that the bush regenerates. So it's got to happen. Yeah, I just wanted to quickly start off with that because it is something that people need to be aware of when you're flying visual meteorolo meteorological conditions. That's a tongue twister that you need to remember if you're flying. You need to be able to see how far, John. Well, you need to be able to see the aeroplane, basically, and be able to navigate it um, safely uh, within your line of sight. But we'll talk more about that later. One of the other things I did quickly speak about CASA with this week was the uh, fire danger. We decided to ground all our ops uh, when fire conditions are catastrophic. I think that makes common sense, um, It's uh, even in any areas. And then when it's extreme, um, we have to assess the area. If it's semi-rural or rural, and the fire conditions are above high uh, mm. in the extreme and severe areas, then you know you've got to do it on a case by case basis. If you're flying in a in a street or something, it's not going to be a problem low level, but uh, definitely ground in catastrophic conditions. Just if you have a flyaway, and um, you know it wouldn't be a good look. So, um, but Casa haven't got any guidance on that yet, and I haven't found much um, worldwide on on uh, assessing fire conditions for ARPAS operations. So. Anyway, yeah. we'll keep looking and see what they come up with. Okay, a couple of things before we get into the news. I just want to quickly um, acknowledge Wayne King, and if you could put the message up there, Grumps, his super chat. Thanks, Wayne, for the $10. Appreciate it. Every little bit helps Ooh. the channel. Woohoo! Okay, um, let's now move on to the news. So right off the bat today, we've got an interesting story, and I'd love to share this and Lloyd you're going to share a link about this one in a couple of moments as well so just imagine you're a guy in an office you've got your equipment in an office everything's all good you got your mouse on your desk and the next thing you know you go away for a coffee and someone's hacked your computer with a drone so that's theoretically possible but just as equally possible is someone else to go and hack your drone. We've got a little short extract of a video and Lloyd's going to put up the link about both hacking devices in an office and we'll talk about how you can hack drones as well in a couple of moments. Let's play the video. Wait for the Zigbee Light Link Touch Link system. White Hat hackers were able to remotely control the Hue lights via drone and cause them to blink SOS and Morse code. The drone carried out the attack from more than a thousand feet away. Using the exploit, the researchers were able to bypass any prohibitions against remote access of the networked light bulbs, and then install malicious firmware. At that point, the researchers were able to so block you can see that they're flashing updates, which SOS the from the drone. They're controlling the drone and doing that. But what about the other side of things? Drone. Let's start. Krasano is an open source framework developed in Python. Its aim is to perform the well, repetitive I'm tasks there, Greg, of penetration uh, testing. You know, from thinking the about that, are they the flying drone the the drone robots. to within a Wi-Fi station? I mean, a lot of people have firewalls down down um, the stream. Absolutely the right. Absolutely yeah, so right. So yeah. there's a couple of things. So the way that people are doing this, and we'll just kill the rest of that video. We don't need to watch that. But essentially, it's awesome. Oops. If you could imagine we, we have a drone, you go and attach a Raspberry Pi board to it. The Raspberry Pi has got Bluetooth, it's got Wi-Fi, everything you could possibly want. Start at the very beginning. How could you attack via Bluetooth? How could you attack via Wi-Fi? Um, from the ground, well, if you've got a building up. Yeah, 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 absolutely. There, there are Wi-Fi um, networks at height 
that you could definitely attack and using a drone is going to make that a hell of a lot easier. You don't have to get physical access to the building. And the well, tools that this the, guy... It's the also tools the coverage. You, you can, you know, you can got, you've got much better coverage if you can park the aeroplane in the sky. Sorry, yeah. Greg. Yeah, yeah. The tools that this guy goes into um, automates the process of attacking and penetrating into Wi-Fi. So that's sitting on a Raspberry Pi board. Send the drone up. You connect to the Raspberry Pi down below and attack the network. But the reason why this is interesting to me at the moment, um, number one, this video is um, out there as part of a training course teaching you how to hack if that's what you're into. But it's interesting to me because with the Mavic Mini um, recently launched, it's a Wi-Fi drone and you can use the same techniques to attack and take over a Wi-Fi enabled drone. So it's just interesting looking at that in the context of the Mavic Mini. Well, it's one of the things where robotics clashes too, because you know we've we've always uh, from from many years ago, robotics uh, engineers, software engineers, decided decided we should have this open platform. So we do. We have a fantastic system uh, based on the Arduino pr um, uh, platform, and of course, mm -hmm. it's very open. Um, I'm not sure where that's going to get locked down eventually when it's going to re be required. To I know DJI have a couple of aircraft. The I know the Mavic Enterprise. Um, and the Matrice, I think, through DJI Pilot, have a, a more robust security for, uh, so you can't sort of get into the aircraft and control it or see the data, most, most importantly, that the, uh, is being streamed. But, you know, we never came along uh, again. We're, we're so new in, in this space. Um, no one ever sort of imagined that there need to be very tight security protocols around it. I'm sure the military... I mean, the problem... The problem in a nutshell is the drones weren't designed to be secure when they first thought of no. building these things, and that never. was kind of an afterthought. No, never ever thought them to be secure. I mean, but a lot of our devices have been playing catch up, um, you know, over the years, phones or everything, you know, as that's why the digital network became so uh, a, a must as well, because the analog system just wasn't, uh, you weren't able to lock that down in the same way. So, you know, it, it's going to be a, a uh, obviously open for a while. I, I think it's this problem that we'll solve though one day. I think it will have to. Uh, like everything else, um, you know, we'll have to solve that. But perhaps um, there will be a war like people, you, your can, phone can be tracked, your position can be tracked on the phone. I'm sure that will be uh, available uh, in the long run to all, you know, drones, of course. Mm. Time will tell. Let's move on to our next story at the moment. We mentioned fire a short while ago, and fire is something that's um, relevant in Australia. We've got lots of it happening at the moment. And the photo we've got on the screen at the moment is a school and showing its close encounter with a bushfire. <clears throat> um, that's one picture, and, you know, the, it, it's showing the potential risks in our country. Beyond that, we've got some more footage. The next one, this is a um, uh, drone footage of, not in Australia, this is in the US, and it took 10 minutes for a fire to totally engulf this house. Um, so fire, you know, how do you actually deal with that and combat that? And this third video is one which we go and see the use of drones. We've got a firefighting drone that's been launched. This one is um, a new venture firm, they're developing um, this one at the moment. Let me see if I can get the info back on my screen. I pressed the wrong button. Sorry about that. That's interesting, isn't it? You need a you need a pretty big aircraft for that. I lost that info, but um, yeah, you can see from the video there they're using that for firefighting. Definitely something that's going to be helpful as we go forward in Australia, but as you quite rightly said, you need a fair bit of lift. Just think about go. the the weight of that, um, the water just in the pipe going up to the drone at the top. Well, then you got someone, then pick, picking someone up as well. So that's not a small, uh, that's not a light aircraft, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, something useful for Australia. And moving on to our third story of the day, we've got another um, emergency related story. This one is, a next generation drone being designed to remove a youth, uh, a person to safety in times of disaster. This one was the venture capital firm, firm developing a one man drone prompted initially by the 2011 earthquake and tsunami disaster. 
Um, so it can pick up one person. Let's just put that on screen. So there you can see it's kind of like a sling person drone. Um, it's designed for power. It's designed for one person and to get, get them out of um, harm's way. Would you write it, John, to use the famous words of Mr. Ken Heron? Oh, man, I'd be, I'd be on that in a heartbeat. Look at it. It looks great. I'd probably skip breakfast, though, because it might not, you know. <laughs> but, yeah, of course. <laughs> I, I, you know, I know the technology. I'm, I'm confident in the technology. Um, and, uh, I, I, you know, a well-built aircraft like that, yeah, absolutely, I'd have a go. Yeah, no problem. And if I tell you what, if, I, if my life was being threatened and I needed to take me somewhere, I most certainly would get onto it. And that's what they're counting on, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, ask anybody in the street um, whether they uh, would do it, you know, and I think it depends off their life being threatened, you know. Yeah, I mean, great. if you had a choice, if you had a choice in bushfire season in Australia, a fire's coming and you thought you were going to be able to defend against it, but then you think, well, here's this drone that can take me away now. I think it's time to go. I'd definitely be yeah. on board. I think, I think that's an interesting design too. If we just look at it um, carefully too, the center of gravity is so low, so... Carefully, yeah, uh, that keeps cleverly. it very, very stable. And, you know, the other thing is it looks like you can just step onto it. So it obviously, you know, it comes down low. Um, it, might be, it might actually touch down. It might need to. Um, you can yep. just step onto the platform and, you know, we know that, that off it would go. That's, that's incredible. It's a, a really clever um, looking design from the get-go. It's got high visibility on it so you can see it. Um, yeah, I, I reckon that there's something in that one. Um, you say it's up for venture capital. It's been been pumped by venture capital. It is at the moment, yeah. This is going to be the exciting part of the industry um, when you know people with great ideas are going to be um, meet up with people with the with the uh, means um, to make their ideas happen. And uh, you know that's probably a case of it right there. Very clever. Yeah. Okay. Let's move on. Next story we've got here is. Again, kind of emergency service related. The Chula Vista Police is the first in the world to use the Skydio 2 drone as part of their, um, their kit, their toy bag. Let's have a look. Look no, not that the one. There we South go. Bay and you could see a new state-of-the-art crime-fighting tool. The Chula Vista Police Department is the first to use the Skydio 2 drone. It was just created in the Bay Area and gives officers faster multi-angle camera capabilities. News 8's Heather Hope is live at the department's headquarters tonight with more on the uplifting details. Heather? Yes, very uplifting. Officers here say they will be the envy of multiple police departments as they have been the first to be able to use this new technology, flying for about four weeks now here in Chula Vista, able to respond to emergency calls. Flying high in the sky. Drone can go places where a police officer really can't go easily. Chula Vista is the first police department in the world to use the Skydio 2 drones. It actually has um, several different cameras on the top and on the bottom of it. Allowing officers to best handle any 911 call. They want help, they want it now. This drone helps us do a great job every single time, keeps our officers safe. Like in this instance, as police search the roof for a possible burglary suspect. And Oftentimes, we don't know where entry is made on a burglary, so not only do we have to check the entire perimeter, but oftentimes we'll check a roof. So we get the idea with the story, but I think it's good that we're using the Skydio um, in particular um, in, in public areas compared to some of the more traditional drones, um, especially with its sense and avoid capabilities to be able to um, keep people in the area safe. John, here's my question. Do you think there will come a time when that type of technology will allow you to get around things like the 30 meter rule, for example. Uh, it does have, um, there is a bit of talk about that because obviously with the right kind of obstacle avoidance, uh, the only problem is it's still, the 30 meter rule is really for failure. You know, no one's counting on, on landing on someone's head, but a point of failure in the aircraft, any single point of failure is why the 30 meter, unlike the populist rule, which defines um, very clearly that you can't fly in an area that um, would create an unreasonable risk if a single failure were happen to happen in the aircraft. The 30 mood rule is a blanket rule. It, it, it's a difficult one, but of course it's the, it's the uh, 
get out of jail free card for the regulator. You know, so something happened and you, you were obviously within 30 metres. Um, and so, or, well, so they feel that that's, that's reasonable. Um, I, I, I had another comment about the video that I, I perhaps we can talk about later. But I, I think that, that, yeah, technology is going to solve that problem. Um, of course, if it was a mini um, X8, we'd have an argument about um, redundancy or if it used the software um, that we've seen capable where the aircraft could spin on the spot if it has a motor failure or propeller failure. But you've got to, you, the 30 meter rule is going to mostly revolve around um, failure. that failure problem. Yep, sure. Mm. Okay, fair call. It'd be interesting to see. Certainly if they're using that more in, in the US, are they? They don't have the thirty meter rule. They've just not meant to fly over. What What's the rule in the US? I'll have to get Lloyd on later. We'll chat to him later. I can't remember the US laws. Do you He's know? There. Uh, look, I, I've got it there. To, um, what What is it at the moment, Lloyd? So we can't um, bring his audio or his picture up at oh, the okay. moment. No Sorry. problem. Okay. No, so I can hear it. So yeah, we'll we'll chat about it. But of course, it's part one hundred and seven. Um, is in the states. There's an overall, um, uh, if you like, rule that sits above all the others that's not often talked about. It says that you can't operate an aircraft, uh, you know, a flying machine, in any way that creates a hazard to a person, another aircraft, or property. And so that that sits above um, uh, any, well, no matter what you're flying or what you're going to fly. Uh, for balloons, rockets, model aircraft, uh, drones, manned aircraft. You can't operate a manned aircraft in a way that creates a hazard to persons. And so they use that rule, uh, that overarching rule, and it really sits above all of the other regulations, but it's there and you can be prosecuted um, for for that. So the other, the 30 metre rule in a sense is guidance, um, if you like. It gives you, it says, well, I'm, what, what do you consider creating a hazard to a person? Uh, well, you can see from their guidance, under 100 grams is considered, uh, uh, you don't need to worry about the 30 metre rule, under 100 grams. So that's not creating a hazard to a person, another manned aircraft or property. And so there's where it, there's where it all sits at the moment. Okay, well, weight. interesting. Um, lots to mm. talk about there. But for the moment, I'm going to move on to our next story. And this one is a helicopter hit where an Air 7 um, news aircraft was struck theoretically according to the reports by a drone over downtown los angeles and um, as a result of that they had to make a precautionary landing um, let's play the video so this is supposedly of the rear section of that helicopter and we'll play the video again after we finish there just so we can watch it a second time Now, obviously, there's been a collision with that part of the aircraft. The question is what? And that's not the video we're looking at next. <laughs> that's all right. Um, yeah, yeah that, that looks like it's hit something solid. Um, and it doesn't look like a bird strike either. I've it doesn't look like bird strike. Agree with no, you 100%. Bird, bird strike wouldn't have the um, penetration like that like that's a solid and i don't can't i can't tell how far apart those two hits are and why so let me ask you this case. question john I, I i i would it be possible oh at, yeah at a later <laughs> at a later time for the avia uh, aviation regulatory authority the ntsb I, I hope they're going to be investigating and looking at that is it possible for there to have been a component of the rotor arm or some bolts or whatever to have fallen off the aircraft because at the moment we've got an unidentified flying object. I'm not trying to say it wasn't a drone, but what do you think? Is it possible? Is it more likely yeah. for it? Yeah, they'll look, they'll go straight over. The aeroplane's been damaged, so you'll know if any other bits are missing off it. There won't be any bits missing off the main rotor uh, or other parts of the helicopter. The only thing that, that may have happened, sometimes can happen with helicopters that are tasked with things, is if they've got um, items attached to them or something goes out the door, that can happen. That can happen very, very easily. So I've been, you know, with mustering pilots when we've been flying low mm. level, and I've, we've been, you know, maneuvering the helicopter around 
quite a bit and a lunchbox went out the door. <laughs> yeah. It was sitting at my feet, you know. Um, and so careless. Um, but, yeah, you, you can have a loose object fly out of a helicopter very easily. It wouldn't be a part of the helicopter. So, yeah, yeah if it looks like it's hit it at, at quite a, a speed. At quite a that's why I was well. thinking of the rotor rather than something that's fallen out of the aircraft. Yeah, so, I mean, well, you've got redundancy, and you've got redundancy in your um, your elevation there, right? So you've got redundancy. You've got multiple bolts holding the propellers oh, on yeah. there. Yeah, that, it, I mean, the tail rotor is quite um, fragile in a helicopter, usually depending on the on the sort of size of the mm. helicopter. So it, it hit it hit the horizontal stabilizer at the back, um, and you know, we we'd all got to be honest with each other. There's a, there's a better than even chance that it was a drone. No, no I agree quite, with you that there's a... It's quite re- possible. <laughs> I, I'd put it at 50-50. I, I just think that there's still a significant possibility that it was something associated with that aircraft itself. That's just yeah. my gut feeling. Okay, well, look, I think they'll have a look at it. What what they'll do with the forensics these days is that they can actually look at where the, the damage is, where that hole's been penetrated, and there'll, there'll be some cast off. Something inside. Oh. Yeah, something inside or some cast off yeah. a small piece, whatever they'll find it, and you know, yeah. once they find that, have a look. You know, hopefully we'll hear um, what it actually was, and 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 then we'll know. You know, if it was someone's, uh, uh, if it was a spanner, then it's fallen out of the aeroplane. Unlikely, unlikely, but uh, yeah. you know, be- because of where it hit too. The other thing about you'd have to be maneuvering the helicopter fairly um, fast and radically to hit get something to fly out and hit the tail like that. You know what I mean? Mm. The parachutists jump out of airplanes yeah. all the time, right next mm. to the tail. Guess what? When you jump out of an airplane, you go down. You don't go back. Um, you do, but you, you mostly go down. Anyway, um, that'll be interesting well, to see how that unfolds. Indeed. We'll do one more story before we go to our guest. This one is a quick one. The International Standards Organization has unveiled a world's first set of drone safety standards. Um, they're releasing this to, and it's due to be published next year, combining a whole heap of processes and procedures so that you can be ISO accredited and so that you can also give them lots of money. I uh, see that's a good cash cow. Yeah. What do you think, John? Are you going to go and get an ISO accreditation for your drone not operations? A, not, not in your life. <laughs> I mean, the lo- the worst thing that can happen is that you know go- the government says, "Oh, everyone's got to be ISO accredited," you know, and and that I get suspicious. Then I think, okay, someone's um, doing a deal there, because mm. you know we 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 have accreditation. We have the government uh, uh, gives you accreditation. Why, you know, it makes a mockery of it. Really, there's a couple of organisations that do this. There's another one called the Basic Aviation Risk Standard Bars. Um, and they have a document that you can buy or, or a company can buy, and it will give you all of the information you need to know before you engage a drone. But you know what? It's a clever business. I'll tell you why. Because most, oh, there's so many corporates out there. They're saying, well, what's with the drone thing? You know, are we allowed to use them? Or aren't we allowed to use them? Is it safe? Um, we could use them for this, but, you know, it's a big mind. What do we have to do? And so all of a sudden, the company comes along and says, guess what? For a small amount, well, for a uh, immediate moderate sound of money, we'll... Um, We'll let you know what you need to know so that you're safe yeah. and protected, and it'll be an ISO uh, accredited company, and we'll make we'll do the checks for you. So yeah, it's a it's a money maker. Yeah, absolutely. Good Speaking one. of money makers, we've got a money maker as our guest on next. Malice Yay! Vex. Hello, Vexy. Yeah, hello, Greg. <laughs> Mate, good to have you coming back and visiting us again. How you doing? Yeah, not too bad. Uh, How's yeah, the people, weather? How's the how's the fires around you? Has it been a bit smoky? Yeah, it, it cleared up about four days. I haven't seen any smoke for about four days. I've been lucky, I think, because I was looking in the news last night, and they're in the everywhere. Bloody sixty kilometers of fire! It's crazy. Yeah. yeah. I heard today um, on the news uh, on Sky News there was a combination of five fires which merged into one big super fire. Yeah. Um, around, I think it was around the Hunter Valley area um, or the Hawkesbury. I can't remember specifically, but yeah, there's big super fire out there at the moment, bigger in coverage area than Sydney, according to the reports. Yeah, it anyway. looks insane. <laughs> yeah. 
Anyway, let's move on. So I, I've got some video footage of yours that um, you, you posted recently. I wanted to chat to you about it. Let's just play that in the background. Now, yep. first of all, tell me about where and what you were flying, what you were doing, and then we're going to talk about the technology that you've got on the aircraft. Uh, I was flying a Armiton Marmot. Uh, okay. With, with a little Foxier Box 2 camera. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is about 15 kilometres drive from Dubbo, just at a local river. And a beautiful spot. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And the aircraft itself, like the thing that caught me and caught my eye was you talked about your emus can fly. What's an emu? <laughs> <laughs> emu flight is a offshoot of beta, uh, beta flight. Yeah. And they've come, come in and put their own little twist on it and added some more stabilization and uh, filtering, different type of filtering to take motor noise out of your shots. Mm -hmm. and, and my camera I'm actually using isn't the best at the moment, but it's still come out with some great footage. So, yeah, <laughs> I was really impressed by it. So we spoke about this just for a few minutes before um, you, you came in today. And yep. from what I understand, so your motor is vibrating at a certain frequency and it's kind of matching the digital stabilization to the frequency of the motor that's spinning to give you that smoother picture. Have I explained it well? Yep. Yep. That, that's exactly right. <laughs> okay. Look, that yep. sounds, it's a cool idea. I like the idea of it. What, tell me what else have you been up to recently? Well, I've been flying a Cessna 737 and it's a 1737 yeah, this is uh, the, I'm pretty sure this is the Macquarie, like a little offshoot of the Macquarie River. Uh, yeah, it's very low at the moment, as you can see. Uh, I At the end of the video, I had to walk across it and it didn't even come up to my knees. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's quite low at the moment. Uh, but yeah, it's a, it's a lovely river. I wish it was a little higher at the moment, but yeah, it's... It's very nice. <laughs> yeah, how are you doing out there water-wise? Uh, not very good, to be truthful. We're in uh, the second year of a drought, uh, and our local dam is at 2% capacity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, heard, uh, I've heard not so good out there. Yeah. John, do you got any um, thoughts or questions for Malice on some of his flying and the aircraft there? <laughs> Oh, I'm just digging the flying at the moment. It's great. <laughs> I mean, you're very, very confident, um, you know, flying over water. I mean, uh, when you said you're up to your knees, I suppose you can get it back. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that's great, man. It's really, really solid. And it's it's so um, – it's actually a challenge to fly over water um, visually because it's very difficult to ga gauge your height. Yeah. Um, when you learn when you're flying um, seaplanes and stuff that very smooth water – and reflection uh, causes an illusion, and many people f um, end up flying into it. Um, so, I mean, this is really, <laughs> really good stuff. Um, did you um, did you work up to flying over water, or was it is it just something that you you know slowly came down lower and lower? Um, to be truthful, I. <laughs> uh, Around Dubbo, there's plenty of like little rivers and stuff like that. So once I started flying, yeah, just just kept at it, trying to work my way over the water. It helps when you got stuff poking out of the water and you can sort of see yep. a bit of a bit absolutely. of something. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And the shorelines within each side of the, of your peripheral vision. Yeah, I and mean, when you fly over a large lake or the ocean, um, <clears throat> excuse me, that's when the um, the illusion is worse. Yeah. But also, when like this one here, flying up sun, yeah. um, you know that that that's a really choice shot. Yeah, it, it it's that's <clears throat> actually I reckon I find it a lot harder flying into the sun and trying to stay low because you yeah the ten everything reflects and yeah it, I'll yeah. admit <clears throat> a couple of times I had a couple of close encounters of. Uh, I felt like I'd nick the water, maybe bounced off a little bit. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah wow, the first time a, I was yeah. looking at this clip, I'm thinking to myself, yeah, most FPV flyers, if you, you know, clip the ground a little bit, you got to, you know, replace a prop or scratched arm. 
flying over the water, it's not so easy. Yeah, I'd, if I did crash in the water, I'd be going swimming. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I, I've done it. A, I've actually landed in the water a couple of times by accident, and you just yeah, unplug the drone. It will get it out of the water as quick as you can. Unplug it and put it in front of a heater overnight, and it's usually right to fly the next day. Uh, <laughs> yeah, let me tell you. Let me let me tell you about salt water. <laughs> yeah, I, I I haven't flown over salt water yet. <laughs> <laughs> salt salt water is a bit different. Um, yeah, but, you, know, you, you can you can also if you know the first thing you do if you crash in salt water is put the airplane in fresh water. <laughs> yeah, That's the just, only ch- chance you've got. Uh, yeah, straight I, away. I, mm. I've got a couple of friends that live like right near the coast, and yeah, he said every time he's crashed in salt water. It's a whole new drone. You have to yeah. build, rebuild. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Yeah, Greg and I are saltwater pilots, aren't we, mate? <laughs> Absolutely. We certainly, we certainly don't don't fly down there as low as you guys do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Look, thanks very much for for joining us, Vexy. Um, uh, stick around in yeah. the chat. And what we're going to do now, we're going to play this week's um, FPV corner. Um, we'll watch that and stick around in the chat and see if we've got any FPV questions for, for Malice and, uh, and or others here. Awesome. Okay, let's roll that. <laughs> So a couple of comments. Um, each and every week we have FPV Corner and Explore Australia. The details of the people who originally shot these videos are in the description. Please be sure to go and check out their channels. This one's from Clark Chekets. Chekets, I think is how you pronounce it. This is Snowy Mountains by Drone. He didn't think this footage would turn out as beautiful as it did, he says in the comments of his original video, but then again, he often underestimates the beauty of the Wasatch Mountain Range. I don't know that name. Do you know Wasatch, John? I'm, I'm not familiar with it. I was just saying it's really, again, another challenge because of the monochromatic view. You know, you don't get a lot of contrast for, you, for gauging your altitude. Um, yeah. And yet, you know, just good flying chops, really. But I, I love it. The blue sky is what gets it. You know, if you had, um, you know, a cloudy sky, it'd be very different. But the blue on top of the of the stark landscape looks great. Really, really good. I, it's it's a whole other thing. If you like skiing, I'd love to, you know, see what a what a really good skier thinks of this. You know, like, <laughs> this is a ride, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Fantastic. That's beautiful. <laughs> I don't know the mountains, so I'm going to look them up, Greg. Yeah, look at that. I'm just looking at it right now, and I think the mountains are in the US, but it must have been an Australian pilot because when uh, Greg Hilton puts all of this together each and every week, he's looking for Australian pilots, Australian content. So we'll have to forgive him for going and finding a US location. Still some good good. flying. Absolutely. Beautiful flying. Speaking of FPV, John, what have you got in your kit bag that's not GPS assisted? I've been meaning to ask you. Uh, well, whatever's there is in pieces um, <laughs> at the moment. I've got a couple. Um, I just haven't put the time into it. I think that um, I think that any FPV pilot that, that has really developed their skill levels up um, will tell you it, it just takes perseverance and you know, a lot of time people try it and then they prang their airplane or damage it enough that it sits in the in the box for a while, um, and you don't you know you don't go back to it. So you've got to relearn your skills again. You know, an FPV a good FPV pilot is someone that when they've lost their airplane, they actually go home and they fix it that night and they fly it the next day, and that that's really what it takes. You know, you've got you've got to actually want to do it, and you're going to have to make those have those prangs. And you're going to have to make those repairs. So, an FPV pilot, also, I've noticed, you know, that the guys that I I check out and talk to get good at repairing their aircraft as well, and they know what they can repair. They know what they've got to keep as spares. You know, they you ask if you've got any propellers, and they'll give you a bag of propellers. You know, 
Um, I'm basic, seeing Malice um, laughing you know, in the preview. It is. <laughs> it is. You, know, you want to quickly put the airplane back together because what you're investing in 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 um, FPP is not the, the, so much the machine. You're investing in the skill. You know, it's it's an uh, undeniably. It's just a skill, and and you can learn it, but you've got to have the one thing you've got to have. Uh, uh, one gift is you've got to be persevere. You've got to have that. Or say, I want to go all the way. And once you get there and jump over that hurdle, um, and then you start flying in interesting places, well, you're never going to let it go. I can imagine it's very addictive, uh, absolutely addictive. There's no. I've got no a question for you, Malice. I've got a question for you, Malice. If you could graph for me on a piece of paper the number of bags of props you go through per <laughs> month since you started flying, is the number of bags increasing or decreasing? Increasing... Or so, let's say decreasing because you're getting better or is it decreasing because you're not being as game as you were when you first started? I'm curious. Uh, um, I, I always find I'm trying to push myself to, like, to get better, get those closer shots and, yeah, more. I go through more props now than when I started. <laughs> <laughs> like I bought 10 packs the other day of 10 packs of four and I used six of those packs in one day. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Ten packs of four and you that, use six? What... Six packs in one day. <laughs> yeah. There you go. So I, it says it all, doesn't it? You know, that, that's where it's at. But again, you know, not, not everyone, some people are going to get to the point where they're going to say, well, I've had enough of this. Um, I, when I was younger, crashed every radio control model airplane I had and I would just either repair it. I was more more likely to, to scavenge all the parts and go and build another one. That's what I used to like to do. But I never left it. You know, it wasn't something that I crashed and said, well, that's enough of that. And, um, you know, it, it, you just have to have to want to go home and do it straight away. As I said, the skill level is um, is very high. Don't, you know, for, and I think people get to know that after a while. Anybody who flies a regular quad, um, and perhaps use a DJI goggles or whatever. Can they're the ones that can appreciate what what real FPV skill is um, and what it involves. You know, non GPS flying. Um, and I think you know, there's a fair bit of evolution inside um, the FPV world as well. And my nephew is is using a simulator, and I, was, I should ask Malice. You know what? Does he use a sim at all? Did a sim help at all? But he, my, my nephew is flying really well on the sim at the moment and, you know, getting ready to, to start breaking props. I started on a uh, simulator myself. Uh, I'll admit it, I was saving for drone parts and that at the time. And, yeah, within in four months, I had a couple of hundred hours up on it. There <laughs> on you the go. Yeah, so yeah, I, yeah, I would no highly recommend a simulator. It saves you money from when you first start, but it also gives you a false sense of how good you are because you can just hit that reset button. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Before we move on, I've got a couple of things that are really relevant to this discussion, but before we do anything, I want to say, number one, as I press that button, Thank you very, very much, Chris Hope. Thank you for that. Very, very much appreciated. And we've got one more over here, Rick Halber. Rick, thank you very much for you super, your super chat as well. There yeah, we go. thanks, guys. Yeah, good support. Thank you. Yeah, Lloyd said the he, he, Lloyd is our normal button pusher. He he's very religious. He's a presbyter, and he pushes the buttons from over there in the US. Boom tish. Um, but it's no, not it's working great. today, so I'll, I'll press it a few times here and there, but the rest of the time I'll be focusing on, on the normal flow of the show. So speaking of which, something that I think is way cool, according to news sources, has MIT invented an uncrashable drone? Uh, it had to happen. <laughs> According to this um, article, the future of ubiquitous commercial drone use could be one step closer to reality with the new breakthrough technology. Now, is this is a car Titanic? crash site. Sorry? <laughs> is, it called, is it called the Titanic? <laughs> Possibly. So the video we've got there is just a car crash site. Now, obviously, no one wants to crash their car. But since uh, Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos' milestone interview in 2013, he promised and prophesied his company would use 
autonomous drones. And ever since then, people have been trying to work out how to do that in a safe manner. Um, and certainly in the aftermath of the 2018 California fires, for instance, drones were sent up to do a lot of surveying. They had some problems. But in a recent report, MIT has created a project. And guess what it's called? You're going to like this, John. Faster. Faster is the name of the project, and it's a concept for trajectory planning model that allows drones to fly at high speed into unknown areas by estimating the quickest possible path between the starting point and the destination and the clever bit as it flies the drone continuously surveys the surrounding areas. Now, I don't know the full details because we've already got collision avoidance, but MIT reckon they've got something that's going to be able to do that faster. Yeah, well, here we go. Let's have a look at it. Um, you know, this is never going to end, is it? Um, faster, higher, autonomous, automatic, safer, never crash. Um, you know, we're going to see it. We're going to see it all, all um, come in waves. Um, Oh, you know, today I, I, I still can't get my mind off the the uh, life saving um, aircraft there with a platform that you just step onto. That was cool. You know, that was very very cool. And yes, so I see great ideas when when people talk about oh we've got uncrashable drones and you know we 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 do it this way or we do it that way. You know, aviation safety um, has taken you know, 120 odd years to get to where it is. And every day it happens. That doesn't happen in a, in necessarily in a wave. Safety and, and the reason we can get into a, a large aluminium tube and fly right across the world today is because every day this is what the focus has been on. And in the early days when even when the first parachute came along and someone had to jump out and try the first parachute, there were going to be risk involved. And eventually, you know, we got to ejection seats, which still are, are developing every day in aviation. There are companies that are working on better and better ejection seats. So this is going to be our world too. We're in aviation now. And so all of the, the real stuff that happens is going to be go under a certain uh, regime of testing um, and going to be under scrutiny and, and trial and error. And we're going to start to join that, that train, um, and that, which is what it is. It, and it never ends, never ends. And it does end when we move to our next story, the first ocean <laughs> flight. Beautiful. That was a that was beautiful. Uh, we've got a hydro powered drone, an o open ocean drone f test flight driven by the goal of improving timely delivery of um, services was completed between two islands in under two hours. And this hydro powered drone flight was the first for um, the US unmanned aerial systems industry and the climax of a collaborative effort, let me turn that down a little bit, um, that began two years ago in the wake of Hurricane Maria. This one is um, hydrogen fuel cell powered DS-30 drone carried 40 simulation vials of blood and other medical health supplies and it carried them 43 miles. Now this isn't actually the flight um, to the from island to island. This is a test flight close to where they uh, manufacture the product. But again, a really cool use of drones and um, good to see some alternate fuel technology as well. That's going to be um, a big part of it as well in, the fuel, in terms of the fuel technology, how, how um, what we're going to develop in that. 43 minutes carrying a lot of stuff. It's, um, you, know, you have to have a lot of lipos to do that job at the moment. Absolutely. Okay, now... We're going to leave that there, and we've got a couple of other quick stories. We've got three more, and uh, these ones are very relevant to what we were doing earlier today um, with um, talking about FPV crashing and all of those kind of things. I'm seeing Malice laughing in the background there. So let me just play the title. My subtitle for this is Fly Safe. You know, we want to encourage people, especially at this time of year, to fly safe and know what not to do. So what better way than to share some footage? Let's play the first one. Straight up and straight down. There's one thing that he forgot. Wind. Oh. Ah. Oh. Oh, that's cool. That was his first use of the drone, straight up and straight down, and he thought nothing can go wrong, except for the fact that it blew off the edge of the cliff. And the second one, yep. have a look at this one, guys. 
let's uh, do our first takeoff of our new new drone over here. We're going to do a hand launch. Oh, yeah, that's, that's risky. Yeah. <laughs> there, we, there we go. Play that oh, one man. more time. I want to see that one more time. Clear for takeoff. Cleared for dropping. <laughs> oh, man. That oh, suit that, that was touches, just... it's gone, isn't it? Well, yeah. you know, Greg, we've, we always have at the beginning of our training sessions, we remind ourselves the old uh, DDIFS uh, principle. Uh, mm -hmm. It stands for don't do anything stupid. Um, and, you know, there's so much common sense that, that um, you can bring in, you know, like, throwing it out the window of a building from a hand launch and taking off first time from a cliff. You know, we all, we laugh at it, um, but yeah, we, we get into remind people. So when Christmas comes around and you open up that on Christmas morning, usually what the first thing it does is someone will take, if they get a drone, will take it out of the box and try and fly it without charging the battery. I don't want to wait around and, for a battery to charge. Let's fly it with what it's got. And let's try the lounge room, you know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Flying tree. inside, and 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 we all know that it's not really healthy to go and have lithium batteries go and run down to the oh, ground. Man. It's yeah. just no, the, the whole deal. So, you know, it, for everyone who's going to get their first aircraft this Christmas or around Christmas time, you know, common sense. Uh, it, it will work. There's plenty of information on on what to do. Flight in open space. Um, where there are no people around and all of that sort of stuff, you can do it. You give yourself a chance. You know, the other day I did a presentation at the, at the Scouts and the Cubs were on that night. We did some filming. They were on their kayaks, sea cubs. And then I had a couple of dads come up to me because usually the dads, are, you know, the kids will look at the aircraft for, for five or ten minutes, but the dads will be hanging around for half an hour asking all sorts of questions. They said, I've had five of these things already. And I said, I just looked at him. I said, rooftops? And he said, yeah, they're all on the roof somewhere. <laughs> you know? um, and they yeah. all, and basically a non-GPS aircraft. And you get that, so what's the problem? Is it, is it it's a GPS aircraft? I said, no, that's not the problem. He said, do I need a GPS so I won't land on the roof? I said, no, you don't need, you need to fly away from the roof. <laughs> you know, you can fly. You can fly a GPS, air, a non-GPS aircraft in a nice wide open space and you probably won't lose it. You have to walk to it uh, when you yeah. want to get it, but it won't be on the roof. So, you know, he laughed at me and he said, oh, they were only about $60 each or so. I'm thinking, oh, okay, five of them, that's 300 bucks. There's a start, you know, we're yeah. on our way to a Mavic, Mavic Mini. Anyway, look, just uh, make the point, you know, DDIFS. Yeah, don't do anything... Mm. Okay, moving on. We've got two quick stories left. The first one I want to ask our viewers, is this real or is it fake? Uh, this is supposedly, we'll put it full screen there, um, them throwing objects up to the drone. Do you think it's real or is it fake? Someone else said in the comments about this one that they thought it was a big um, bottle sitting on the ground. I don't know. But anyway, the, the message is, if you are flying a drone, don't get so close to someone's house that you can throw a bottle at it. Don't fly over the top of them um, at, at Christmas time. It's just not worth it. But is it fake? What do you reckon, John? Uh, it looks like the real deal to me. I'm just thinking, you know, I, 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 I'm trying to see a better view of the people's faces. Um, if they're ag angry at it and they were drinking a beer in their backyard, that's the first thing they'd throw at it, uh, yeah. what was in hand. You know, I, so. yeah. I've talked to the pilot who flew this. You have? Yeah. There you go. Okay. Yeah. The so, fact that I've got you on this week is just so <laughs> priceless. Who is, who is it? I want to know I who's responsible. His, I can't remember his name, but he, <laughs> he was talking to me about it in the uh, UAV Futures Discord one day about it. Yeah. And... Yeah, he it was a it was a DJI drone, and he was flying it. Um, he, he it was up above the thirty meter mark, and he was just flying around a cul-de-sac. And yeah. yeah, they were his neighbors. He always has problems with them. <laughs> okay, so it wasn't he wasn't flying directly above, and the camera was angled, was it? Or yeah, he was actually out in the street, like okay. above above there, like yeah, about. 
out the front and yeah they just they were like no we don't want you flying near our house so yeah they started throwing bo- beer bottles at him <laughs> yeah. okay yeah, you've lost the battle when it gets the beer bottle thrown haven't you <sighs> sorry yeah. there's someone at the door well vexy we're there gonna go. say goodbye to you anyway because i want to go and put lloyd in for something just after um the last news story so you're going and answering your door can you Sorry. hear me still yeah i'll yep. just say goodbye to you i'm going to put lloydy in so thanks for being with us malice uh, thanks yeah, for Mal. having me greg it's stick been around awesome in chat as afterwards. Usual. yeah yeah <laughs> stick around in chat afterwards yeah <laughs> okay keep sending those vids man keep sending those videos okay Will do. so we'll say goodbye to malice and um, i'll get my producer to go and put lloyd into that position see you over there and we've got one more news story over here so this one here happened in Salt Lake City. Now, John, I want to imagine that you're a US citizen. I want you to imagine that you're a trained, licensed Part 107 certified pilot. Yep. You're flying your drone, you're flying your aircraft, and you've sent it away and you've done some stuff. And at the end, you're bringing it back and you're flying it back towards you. Yep. Now, my producer is still doing stuff over there, so I'll just get her to pause that for a minute and play the video. This pilot, after doing that, had something a little bit interesting happen to him in Salt Lake City. According to the Houston Chronicle, he flew the drone into his face. Ouch. <laughs> That's all. And this is not him. This is just some stock footage, but I thought it would be a good laugh anyway, nonetheless. But can you... How can you actually fly a drone into your face? Oh, you can um, do it. You can absolutely do it. Um, but as a, as a the, trained, licensed pilot? Well, you know, you, you do hand catches all the time, don't you? I do hand catches, but I do it in a safe manner. You know, you hold your arm out yeah. as far as you can from you if you're going to hand catch. Okay. Tell me what can go, what can go wrong in a hand catch. I mean, you're, um, you're pro- here it is, right in proximity to the aircraft. So if something goes, anything goes wrong where you bump the stick, you drop the transmitter. So you're holding the transmitter and you're catching with one hand. Am I right? Yep. Yeah, you know what? Uh, I do this too. And I can, I'm telling you that when, when the aircraft just ends into your hand, particularly if you do, do it with a Mavic 2, and I've just finally worked out to do that, Every time now I turn my face on the side while I'm catching it like that and I put lean away because it's just mm. going to happen. It's just going to happen. It's going to strike me in the face. Um, so flying it back towards yourself, um, if he's in a hurry or whatever and has made a goof, obviously you need to descend at a slower rate and all that sort of stuff. Um, you know, Malice would be telling us that you'd probably run into himself a few times with FPV aircraft and you'd do that. <laughs> no, he says no. He says no, you wouldn't do it. But like I can see he's got a, you know, got a few prop scars around the around the side of the chops. Yeah, um, he's got yeah, the just, beard there to cover up all the scars, I think. Oh, yeah, that's the prop scars. No, you don't. Yeah, at high speed, of course, he'd be telling you, yeah, it would be very dangerous to hit yourself, even with a lightweight aircraft um, at speed. Um, and that's what maybe maybe was involved i've had you know we've had finger chops anybody had a finger chop for, for, everyone's for had a little stupid? finger chop yeah okay so you know all of these things can when you're when you're in proximity to the aircraft while it's running or flying there's a chance that you can get injured from it for sure don't get anywhere near an inspire i can tell you that i've seen an inspire do damage i've seen yeah it, I've but this seen one it. This one, the guy wasn't trying to do a hand catch or anything. It just says the drone flew into a man's the man's face during its descent, causing inju- injuries that required medical attention, according to Detective Greg Wilkins. Um, it I, I was, totally believe it can happen. I, I have no doubt at all that you can do that. I really do. I I I don't. I could you know I could count a few times when and I've been in a hurry and coming back, and I've been a bit careless. Uh, and I could see how that could happen. I've, I haven't hit myself yet. I've, I've had finger chops, uh, mostly in fixed wings, you know, because they're they're a different beast, um, and they've been mm. nasty, some of them. So, you know, lots of model aeroplane starting glow engines in the past, you had finger chops. And, I mean, that, that sort of damage, you think about it, um, the years that we fly a model aeroplane with, with um, you know, gasoline engines, the damage that they can do, I mean, it would it, it would kill you. There's no doubt. 
Yeah, the airplanes yeah. we're flying today are a lot lighter and a lot safer in many ways. Yeah. Anyway, we've reached that point of the show where we're going to go and have our Explore Australia clip. So let's do that. Yeah, Lloyd will come later, baby. My wife's just, my producer's just saying, I thought Lloyd was next. He'll come. Okay. Now, every time I get an, an email from Greg Hilton, who produces this segment, he always has something interesting to say at the top. Last time he said, get your dancing shoes on. It's time for Explore Australia. This time he says it's a rip snorter of a week because he's got some incredible footage. Rip snorter, for those people who don't live in Australia, is a term that means it's really good. Anyway, getting on to the first one. The Drone Way is the photographer in this one. This is from the Bunda Cliffs on the Nullarbor in South Australia. He comments that he obtained a permit from the Department of Environment and Water for this footage. Descent cliffs that needed to be seen to be believed, according, sorry, decent cliffs that needed to be seen to be believed. Many sleeping in vans on the edge. Sunrise and sunsets are pretty special there. So that was his first one. Second one comes from Style Film. This is at Katana Wetlands in North Queensland. Um, this is uh, over Cairns Northern Beaches. As always, encourage you to definitely check out the creators who recorded the original footage. It's all located in the description for the video. Go to their channel, let them know that you saw them here and uh, subscribe to them if you'd like to see more of their great content. This is from Style Film. Side little comment while we're waiting for the next one, just letting people know we're not just on YouTube, we're on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Twitch, uh, Mixer, Smashcast, DLive, all of them at the same time. So. There's lots of people watching us on different platforms. Encourage you to go and subscribe to us and get our subscribe accounts up on a few of those other platforms. That'd help greatly as well. Third one today, Australia by Drone. This is at Angel Sea at Aries Inlet, Victoria. The original footage is in 4K. Unfortunately, I can't stream in 4K. The wonderful MBN isn't powerful enough for that. 720 is all we're game to do. But go, go to their channel, Australia by Drone is the original channel and it's rather, it's a very similar name to a really good channel that I've heard about. Australia by Drone, what does that sound like? Aries Inlet. Have you? Where's that, John? Have you heard of that one? Yeah, I have. Um, we're WA, aren't we? West Australia. I'm not sure. Um, I could be. I could be wrong there. Um, I'm trying to trying to type madly. It, uh, Great Ocean uh, Road, southwest of Melbourne. There we go. Yep. There we go. That's um beautiful spot in the world. Oh, the water's incredibly blue there. I thought it was a darker colour. Great part of the world though. The, the most incredible road to drive on down there, the Great Ocean Road. So and I've just put muscle. Lloyd's mic up. I've just put Lloyd's mic up as well. So you're welcome to um, comment on that as well. Um, and in a moment, I'm going to get Lloyd to ask the have the discussion that you we had before the show today. Uh-oh. <laughs> right, right, yeah. Now, this is some gorgeous footage. We should always, um, hey, Greg, if we can, right. we'd love to know the platform that shot it, you know what I mean? Maybe. I wish I could. It's not always available. See, that you've got to imagine we've got the original videos that these things come from. If they don't tell us, I don't have the information. Maybe we could sort of start a thing where let us know, you know, uh, when in yeah. maybe even put it in the uh, a comment uh, line mm. or if someone's watching it. Let us know what you shot because I think a lot of, of a lot of pilots are interested in that. You think you're trying to guess? 
like I'm looking at the, the picture itself thinking, yeah, that's a, that's a, um, uh, probably a, a Mavic 2 or, or a Phantom 4 type of, uh, type of color, looking at the color. They all, to me, a lot of the um, DJI aircraft have different color. Um, color profiles, within, yeah. In, in, yeah, within, right. in the aircraft, which is really interesting. You know, so... Um, this looks I'd like be, it might be guessing. color graded. Yeah, I think yeah, that one's been color thing. graded. It feels like it has been. Yeah, yeah. it does. It, you can see that too, because that's always a possi possibility. Well, when you when you see the raw footage, um, not necessarily suggesting it should be. I, I like the I like to see a finished product like that. Yeah. Horizon flat. Look at that. Nice and straight. Yep. Okay. Next one we've got the drone way. We've had his work on before silo art in mid north victoria a couple of days holiday with his drone and this is what came out oh wow yeah cool where is this at this is in yes. victoria on the well, well, silos is. that have been painted on and well not graffitied i won't call it graffiti it's too incredible right. to use that word. How the yeah. hell do you even do that? Like your abseil, <laughs> or what do you do? How do you put that on there? <clears throat> you use that new painting drone. Have you seen that one, John? That's, yeah, I, yeah, I was like, I'm... no. <laughs> <laughs> well, the reason I asked where it was from is because uh, uh, Mel from 400 AGL had some very similar footage. Uh, and I thought, and that was taken over in Fort Smith. Uh, Arkansas here in the mm. States I thought surely not so but the artist is you know like I said the shots looked almost identical I thought where's that from mm. so again this one the creator the drone way do go to the description for our video today it's got links to his channel Check out some of his other stuff and let him know that we sent you. Yeah, great. While I was up flying around um, the mudgy area and Golgong and all of that, I didn't really get much flying in because the weather was pretty awful. The smoke up there was not enjoyable, but I did get um, some footage of an old church and that was one place that I planned that I wanted to actually fly at and it was absolutely beautiful except for one thing What's you that? breathe the air and you breathe not only the smoke but you also breathe the flies in that are flying around you there were that many of them it was absolutely insane our last That's one today you from... talk with your teeth. yeah our last one today is from Gizmo Drones, Melbourne CBD by drone. Um, he's trying to capture the incredible city of Melbourne with his trusty drone. Most of the shots are at sunrise or sunset, as we all know, the golden hour. Um, he wanted to fly safely. Um, just a few comments. He said, please note that I only fly for fun and that I fly safely within the drone flight rules. He specifically said in the description for the video, he checked for other aircraft, he stayed low at treetop height, or he landed if there are other low aircraft nearby, otherwise no higher than 120 metres and no closer than 5.5 k's to a controlled airport, no closer than 30 metres from people, no flights over crowds, keep the drone in line of sight and controlled safely. The fact that he's taken the time to go and put all of that information in the description for his video I think is a smart thing to do. Because yeah. if someone goes and complains to CASA, well, they're going to look at that and say, well, he's done all of the things right. Can we disprove any of them? No. So let's move on. Well, the, more importantly, is the message he's giving to other people that would love to shoot something like that. Absolutely. So, you, know, you, can't, you can't just go out on a, on a, on a morning and, and not have a think about it and plan it uh, properly. So, yeah, you, you can do it. You can do a lot of this stuff very safely. Um, I'll fly down near the river there uh, with Tom one day. We, we contacted the local helicopter guy, and he he said, um, you know, here's a we were listening on the same frequency. He was the only risk really that the helicopters that fly across the river. 
um, and doing joy flights. But he said, oh, I've, I've got a, this part of the day, I'm not, I've got any bookings, you know, so go for your life. And, and it is, it's easy to do, you've got to just take your time to do it. Nice stuff. Look at that, good isn't it? Absolutely. So as always, if you've got some videos you want to send in to us, we'll put an email address up as we finish today. So feel free to go and send us some really cool clips. Malice, um, he got in touch with us recently and uh, it caused me to go and have a look and I, I saw that one and I wanted to find out about the emu that can't fly. The flightless bird. That is so cool. Picking a name of a flightless bird for the software that they're running on that. Has to be an Australian in the thought of that one. That is awesome. And there we go. So that was Gizmo Drones. Thank you for that. And thank you to all of the people who sent in or were picked up this week. Now, I've got one last thing that I want to do before we... Actually, let's do the announcements first. I'll quickly get them out of the way. I mentioned... Do follow us on other social media platforms, on Twitter, on Facebook, on Twitch, on DLive, on Mixer, on Smashcast. It helps us out to grow our audience on those. And, you know, if you follow us and like us, maybe we'll pick up some other people over there. So that helps us out a little bit. If you do want to send something in, upload at gregkunit.com. We'll reach us over here. And if you've got anything physically you would like to send our way, postal address is 5 slash 127 Princess Highway, Sylvania, New South Wales, 224 Australia. So there's our announcements. Now we're going to put Lloyd up on the screen just for a couple of moments. Lloyd. Yes. Hey, Lloyd. I'm here. Hey, there John. <laughs> I'm good. How about you? I'm good. <laughs> so you had a question for john or a story or just i'll, I'll yeah. take it away yeah, okay well we know john's been in to aviation forever but uh i wanted to ask him uh because he had aspiration to be an astronaut so how did your first flight go john to try and <laughs> launch to the moon i i'm still wondering how you how you know about this but uh, it, it, it's a story that floated around uh, and, and it's a true story. In uh, the late 1960s, of course, where everyone was taken up by going to the moon, I was um, into model aeroplanes. Even, you know, my father encouraged me to build planes when I was five, six, seven years old. And there we were. Um, I'm in 1960. So I was nine when, when we were going to the moon. And by then, I had it all worked out. You know, I had model rockets and, and you know, I knew all of the parts <laughs> of the of the modules, I'd, I'd followed the Mercury, uh, everything. I, I knew all those guys, knew all the astronauts. So I, I decided that I would I would launch a uh, trip to the moon, an expedition, if you like, with my brother. And what we did was first we had to build a rocket, of course. And so we, we got all the kids in the street to donate their pocket money. And in those days you could buy sky rockets, like I'm talking big sky rockets. So we figured right. if we had enough of those, and we attached them to the vehicle that we could get it airborne. So I had a tea chest. I don't know if you call it the same thing. It's a wooden box. And uh, we built a yeah. ramp so that the tea chest would, would go off the ramp uh, right. angle at 45 degrees. And we had about 53 of these large sky rockets all attached to the bottom of it. And what they did was that my brother and I, um, you know, who he was the ground control. All the other kids in the street were helping. And I had a plastic bag over my head and a number of plastic bags inside. And I had a space that's like gum boots, track pants, uh, the oh whole deal, I, I, you know, some uh, a, a cheese sandwich, uh, everything. And they nailed me inside the box, right? So I was oh, nailed inside. Oh, my God. And then, and then the countdown, and the night before, we built this thing in the backyard and we had a cover over it to keep it from my parents from seeing it. And they knew we were up to something, but we were always up to something. So the night before, you know, we're out there and, and we can see the moon, you know. And, and right. my brother, who was two years younger than me, he's seven years old, he says, man, look at this. The, the ramp is pointing this way, you know, and to, towards uh, the opposite direction. The moon is over here, you know, and you're taking off that way. And I looked him in the eye and I said, brother, you know, I said, 
by the time I get there in four days, the moon will have travelled across the sky to where I'm going to arrive. And he thought I was a genius. <laughs> he thought I was an absolute <laughs> genius. He says, we're really doing this. You know, we're going. And so he was worried about getting back. And I said, look, what I'm going to do is when I get there, I'm going to get a lift back with those guys. Like, they're not going to leave me there. Do you reckon they would leave me there when I arrive? They're not going to yeah. do it. They're going to take me back. And he thought, okay, that's fair enough. That, that seemed logical. You know, everything else was, no, nothing about landing on the moon. So anyway, the next day we've, we've timed it. All the kids are there. And eight kids have a box of matches, right? And they're all standing around the back of this thing about to light, I don't know, maybe oh. six or seven pounds of gunpowder. Right, with a and you're inside, guy. nailed and into inside, this box. I'm in. I'm nailed. I'm nailed inside the box with a plastic bag over my head. Right. <laughs> <laughs> There's a number of ways that I could become heavenly in this point, and I don't mean yeah, going into exactly. orbit either. I mean it could be a hev heavenly trip. So anyway, they all lit. They counted down and they lit the thing. And of course, what happened was the the fireworks were pretty serious. And so the thing actually rolled off the ramp, right? And and once it got of the first roll and it fell off the ramp, um, and it, it went in the yard and it was sort of just vibrating and gyrating. All the kids were screaming and running in every direction. And I was inside <laughs> thinking, hanging on, going, man, I'm going through the atmosphere. You know, I could <laughs> smell the smoke. I was, I was I could see everything happening. I didn't know where. I was going to pitch black, you know, and I had the turbulence. I'm rolling around. I thought, man, I'll be there soon, hopefully. <laughs> anyway, my father comes out and he sees uh, a, the box in the middle of the yard on fire, right, with, with still smoke everywhere, and it's obviously almost started a small grass fire. So he looks around. He sees all the kids in the street, and he does a quick head count, and he thinks, where's John? Ah, uh, that's easy. I know where John is. He'll be in the box. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so, so anyway, James said, he's in the box. He's in the box. So dad goes over and he's got the hose and he's put the fire out, you know, and I'm inside. And, of course, <laughs> when he ripped open the box, you know, actually pulled it uh, open and I looked out, you know, he sees me inside with a plastic bag on my head. And the first thing, I spoke first, which is always a mistake. You know, I said, Dad, what are you doing on the moon? <laughs> oh, oh, my God. <laughs> I tell you what, man, I couldn't sit down for a week. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that is hilarious. So, uh, yeah, that was my first trip, my first thing as an astronaut. And, uh, you know, I perseverance, I stuck with it and, I started learning to fly when I was 15. It's hard to believe that six years later I was in a Cessna 150 and taking flying lessons, you know. Um, yeah. I didn't manage to set fire to it um, or put plastic bags on my head. But, um, <laughs> you know, I, it, it, it's hard to it believe is. your father let you get into another aircraft after that. Oh, well, you know what? DDIFS means a whole lot. But when you're nine, you know, you're going through the science of it. And what's interesting about uh, you know, having a seven-year-old brother too that's going, yeah, man, that'll work. Yeah, everything I, you know, that's good. You know, he thinks I know everything, right? <laughs> but there, there, there really wasn't enough science in, in, that we involved. We did. There was no aeronautical calculations. All there was <laughs> was a box, fifty, a lot of gunpowder, um, plastic bags, and gum boots. You know, and uh, <laughs> it, it was never. Gonna... And one of the other things that I never told in the story, Lloyd, that building up to that, I believed that to to bounce around on the moon, you had to have leg strength, you know, like I watched the astronauts. And so I, I decided that I would find some elevated areas that I could jump off onto the ground, you know what I mean? <laughs> and, and so I found one at school. And so one of the teachers came up to me one day and I was here, I was jumping off this ledge onto the ground, you know, over and over again and climbing up and jumping off and, you know, it wasn't strange for her to see me doing that because they knew me at school. And she said, Morrison, <laughs> you know, what are you doing? Are you going to break your leg or break your ankle or something? You know, stop doing that. And I said, well, you know, I'm training for the moon. Yeah, and uh, shook her head, you know. And I thought, I thought, you know, teachers should understand more about, yeah. you know, moon. Right. I, right. I, I straight away said, you know, look, if you sit down for a minute, I'll go through it all with you, you know, and I'll, I'll educate you on this. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, my trip anyway. to the moon. Thanks for asking, Lloyd.
Yeah, well, it was much longer. I liked your version because it's much longer than the story you told on uh, about your brother's uh, uh, This Is Your Life. And yes, that's, that's where right. I heard it. For, that's where I heard it first. Oh, is that right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and I, I've been wanting. Yeah, yeah I've been wanting to ask you about it. that ever since uh, yeah. I first saw that, and you've been gone or or something, and this is the first chance I got to ask. Okay, thank you for asking. Well, James wrote a book called "Blowing My Own Trumpet." Um, that those of you who musicians might know of my younger brother James. And so there's a lot of stuff in that book about the things we did when we were younger in boats, which is um, which would uh, absolutely. And then now we're teenagers in boats, and the things, the the trips that we tried to launch in rafts to New Zealand, um, the water police picking us up, <laughs> taking us home. We were charged with being a navigational hazard. Uh, you know, it just went on and on and on. So uh, you know, life is that kind of adventure. You know, <laughs> why wouldn't I end up flying drones? I mean. Okay, exactly. You know, obvious <laughs> that I would fit perfectly within or with all you yep. guys, right? Yep. Doing you fit this, in this you know, crowd well. And we weren't going to miss it, you know. Alice is laughing in the background. He said, "Yeah, I did all that stupid stuff too." Yeah. yeah. Exactly. <laughs> well, it's been fun hearing the story, but I think we've reached the end of the show, and uh, it's getting to that time where we've got to say goodbye. So, look, Lloyd, thank you for the extra supplementary question. It was good to have that one come from you. Yeah. Thank yeah. you for being the researcher for the program. Thanks, Lloyd. Thanks, Lloyd. You're quite welcome. <laughs> and, John, thank you for letting us um, – thank you for being the ridicule of our conversation here this afternoon or this morning. Thank you, this afternoon, I, yeah. I, I just want to say to my chief pilot son, you can't prove anything. If you didn't see it, it didn't happen. <laughs> Okay, so after the show, there's going to be some chat in the Discord, and I tell you what I'm going to do. While the music is playing out today, if anyone jumps into the Discord quick enough, I'm going to try and get your conversations over the top of the playout music. So jump into Discord, say hello, and you can be on the show as well. So there we go. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being part of the show, John, Lloyd, yeah. Malice, yep. and we'll yep. see you yeah. next time. Bye-bye. See you, guys.
So hello everyone, I'm still here and I've got my mobile phone near my microphone just so that we can send the Discord live. John is near us, he hasn't come into the Discord yet, he's working on that. But that's okay. I'm, I'm working on it my other device, so I think I'm going to stay here. You want verification of this story? You want verification? It was a good story, it was a good story. Well, you have to, you have to check uh, the components. How much air did you have in your plastic bag, John? <laughs> <laughs> well, as, as I mentioned... John, just so you know, they can't hear you, so that's why okay. we've got to get you in there. Okay, good. I'll I'll get in there. So, so should I go to my iPad or should I plug in my phone? My, hang on a sec. I'll try and get the laptop in there. Um, so apologies. I'm looking for the link. Is it a YouTube link? So Lloyd will paste, paste that in the chat one more time, hopefully. Have you found it, Lloydie? I uh, can't hear Lloyd at the moment either. Okay. Can someone uh, in the chat room paste it yeah. back in the chat? That would be awesome. Yeah. Done. Oh, yep. Done. There you go, John. 400 AGL has just posted a link in the chat room. I got it. Can I get into the copy? Okay, welcome back. So I just do it my email. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Sorry, so guys. our music is finished and normally the show's all done at this point in time. But just for a bit of an experiment, I thought let's bring people. So who have we got in Discord at the moment? We can see Grumpy, we can see Kingy, Malice Vex, High Tech Redneck, Phantom Trucker, Timeless and myself. Welcome, everyone. Welcome. Oh, hello. Uh, hey, Greg. Well done. Good story, John. <laughs> thank you. <Yeah. laughs> John says thank you. I can still hear him in the um, rendezvous where we do the video stuff from. He's going to try and get across. This is new for him, so you got to pardon oh, him. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to get a... Um, I'm getting a... Um, what's a server name? You know, I'm the stream. Greg, I went listen to it. Sorry, what was that, Mel? So the audio from here is going out on the stream now. I went and listened to it. Yeah, that's because I'm holding my mobile phone next to okay. my mic, which is going live. By the uh, way, speaking of technology, John's, John's having some fun with the technology of trying to work out how to get into Discord. I just wanted to share a quick story. Um, John shared... He, John, uh, the server name you shouldn't need to, to do anything with, John. You should just click on the invite and it should send you there. Okay, All right. I'm going to try that again. So while okay, that's ahead. happening, let me share um, a quick story. My father, as you know, has been unwell. Um, he had some brain surgery recently and then went to rehab. The good news is he's a lot better. He's back at home, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I want to share the funny story from from rehab. So one of the things they want him to do is to make breakfast for himself to make sure that he's able to look after himself when he gets home. First thing he says, of course, is, well, my wife can do that. Don't worry. And they said, no, we still want you to do it. <laughs> so then he said, okay. And he um, gets in front of um, this cooktop and he says, where's the hot plate? It was an induction cooktop. He didn't know how to work it. I've never seen him, eh? He'd never seen an induction cooktop before. I'm trying again, Greg. Uh, sorry. Uh, I'm going to get so John's still trying in the background. I'll tell you what, I'm going to see if I can find... I had to drop out of... Uh, uh, yeah. Right if I log on to the link that AGL sent me, Greg... Yeah, it takes, it, I've phone. logged... Can you guys hear me at all? Yeah, yeah we can hear you. Okay. John, um, I'll just... Um, just like a normal phone call. Yeah, John, what I'll do, I will get a link and I'll send it to you by text message, okay? Yeah, I'll send it to you by email. You're going to have to drop out of rendezvous as well, the, the guys are saying. So Lloyd couldn't get in there while he was in rendezvous. I'll send you a text message with it. Okay. Because you can just go through Discord settings and have it set to the microphone and camera that you want. Well, that's not overcomplicated for poor John. <laughs> okay. Because <laughs> yeah, by default, it does set up for a default microphone and default video device. Yeah. Well, let's face it. Lloyd couldn't even get it working, you know. Yeah, I was, I, well, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I was I was in the rendezvous, and of course that takes a 
over control of your mind. Yeah. Is that a kid or is that a goat? Oh, that, that, that's that's my kid. Um, oh, okay. Lloyd, that uh, was a that was a dangling participle, Lloyd, because a kid is a goat. I know, oh. but <laughs> <laughs> You should have said child or goat. Yeah, I know. As soon as I said it, I knew I'd said it wrong, or somebody's going to catch me on it. Good on I had, to pick up my, yeah. I had to pick up my kids from my parents, and I was just uh, driving home. I seen everybody was in, so I thought, hey, might as well talk. Yeah, that's a little bit. So how many kids have you got there with you? I have two. Uh, your own or grandkids? What's that? Are they your own or grandkids? They are my spawn. Nice. So at this point, I'm just going to pause for a minute. I'll, I'm going to post the link. I've already given it to John via text message. I'm going to post it one more in the YouTube chat. And at that point, I'm going to shut down the stream and say thanks to everyone for watching as always. Thank you for being part of it. And we hope you'll jump into the Discord and have a post-show chat with us there. So see you next time, guys. Yeah, my uh, buddy, Grant Smith, from, who lives in Adelaide, he's the one who told me about, uh, got me the link, and that's how I got the story for, uh, about John. <clears throat> but I was I really good, Lloyd. In fact, I think um, John's story made the show today. <laughs> I knew it would, because it, I heard him tell it, it was on This Is Your Life Australia, is where I heard him say it, and it was for his brother. And he told that story, and my wife just died laughing. And I haven't had a chance to ask him about it since I saw that. And because uh, we've either missed, you know, either I have been on or he had been on it or something like that. And I just, you know, I start. The first thing I asked him when I saw him on there. Um, okay, so I've just muted that Discord. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being part of it. I've posted the link. See you next time, guys. Bye for now.